Today we talk about uh, PV performance, uh, we talk about optical, terminal, and electrical modeling, about simulation, measurements, balance of system improvement, and optimization of uh, PV performance, um, yield, and costs. First, I will start uh, with the electrical energy prediction. Uh, then I talk about optical performance optimization and then about the terminal performance optimization and finally about the balance of system costs optimization. We take a look at uh, the STC performance versus uh, the actual measured performance. Uh, you come uh, to this graph. This was carried out uh, during uh, the so-called 1000 roofs programs in Germany. Uh, this was the first time uh, where many uh, models have been really uh, monitored and uh, on the right the dotted uh, the dash line uh, is the predicted performance um, according to standard test conditions so at the power of 1000 watt per square meter of irradian uh, an air mass equivalent to am 1.5 perpendicular irradians and the operating temperature of 25 degrees on um, on the left side you see the bars uh, show the actual performance and uh, the deviation from the uh, performance predicted by standard test conditions you see that it was a last difference uh, it was minus 30 minus 35 uh, percent um, this was carried out in, in 1995 but even today there is a large deviation from that and we want to take a look at uh, this uh, why is this happening So um, we want to do a yield prediction uh, via a good model. So we uh, check out the model. Uh, we found out that real world is not STC and not standard test conditions. Why? We know already when we talk in the theory. So indoor tests is not equivalent to outdoor test performance. Uh, we have temperature effects. Usually the temperature is uh, much more elevated than the 25 degrees Celsius under standard test conditions. We have non-perpendicular incidents in the real world and um, we have uh, uh, low irradiance levels. It's called the weak light effects uh, that we talked also about when we talked about the uh, equivalent circuit of the PV modules. Then we also have spectral effects. So real world is not always AM 1.5. There's deviations from it. Usually if you have uh, crystalline silicon solar cells at a higher AM, modules is performing better at lower AMs uh, the uh, modules perform worse and uh, at the end uh, what we want to know is the electrical energy yield the unit kilowatt hour of electrical energy being produced during one year for one kilowatt uh, of PV panel installed with an INSP that means under standard test conditions we set up this model here so we started uh, with the solar spectrum According uh, to the Commission Internationale d'Eclairage, um, there we have uh, the homogeneity, uh, the spectrum of the this, uh, of, uh, of of direct and diffuse irradiance. Um, while diffuse irradiance couldn't be treated as a whole, uh, we traced every a part of the sky sphere to the module and take a look at uh, the cell reaching energy or cell reaching power, uh, also the spectrum of it in order to have an accurate representation of uh, the um, incoming irradiance. Uh, then uh, we have the solar cell module. Some of the irradiance is converted into uh, electricity. Some part is reflected or transmitted and uh, the rest is all transmitted into uh, heat flow and uh, uh, transferred, uh, transformed into um, uh, heat, uh, uh, heat and heating up the, the module. So this is done here. So this is, uh, if the performance is not very well, there's a higher share being transformed in heat into heat flow. Uh, if the um, solar cell performance is really good, for example, think about if we would have a performance of 100%, there's nothing remaining for uh, the heating up of the module and the temperature would be the same as ambient temperature. And then most important is our data output. So this is sure for temperature, but most important is the power curve, how much power we are producing um, during daytime, um, during a, a, a week, a month, a year, or uh, during lifetime. 
let's first start with the optical modeling. So uh, we talked about already about the irradiance modeling. Now we come to the solar module and uh, this is a um, composition of the solar module. So we have on top, we have the glass sheet, then we have the EVA, then we have the silicon nitride as an anti-reflective layer. And then uh, we have the silicon, which are our silicon solar cells. This N represents the optical refractive index. Uh, so we have for glass, we usually have uh, in, uh, optical refractive index of 1.54 to 1.51. Uh, this depends on the type of glass, but also on the wavelength uh, which you apply. And this is called this effective, uh, is called dispersion. As you see for glass, this is dispersion is not very big, but if you come to the other materials, uh, EVA, silicon nitride, and especially silicon, this dispersion is rather big. So there's a big deviation in, in refractive index uh, depending on the wavelength. This was considered in the modeling. I show you the results a bit later. Uh, and uh, so you know already from the Fresnel law. So this depends on the, uh, not only on the refractive index, but also on the inclination angle. So we have theta zero and here inside the material one, we have theta one. And uh, this is a reflected part. This is a transmitted part. Uh, then we have the next interface from glass to EVA. There is a transmitted part and a reflected part. The reflected part is not totally lost. It is re-reflected at the boundary from glass towards air, and we can still profit of, uh, some re reflection. And so on, we continue that, and at the end, we want to collect all uh, the, uh, um, the arrays uh, reaching the silicon solar cell and want to match that with the actual uh, spectral uh, sensitivity of the solar cell. These are some results. So uh, this is a time of day and the according uh, incidence angle. So at midday, we have almost a perpendicular incidence. And so um, the highest uh, optical performance with the lowest reflection. Here we have the different kind of model. So as you find out the uh, literature, this is, uh, uh, doesn't consider the incident angle and only considering one interface, the air to glass interface. And there we have a reflection of 4% only, or in other words, a transmission rate of 96%. Uh, the next model, uh, this line uh, shows uh, the performance if you really consider the actual incidence angle. So you see here at sunrise, uh, the sun is uh, coming in very in a fl very flat angle. Therefore, uh, the reflection is very high and optical performance is really low. So we lose about more than 20% uh, due to reflection. Uh, then uh, the sun inclines, uh, the reflection incidence angle is getting smaller and at midday it's almost zero and uh, or is actually zero. Uh, that's deviation between that uh, literature um, um, value and uh, our actual value is due to uh, the, we don't have all irradiance coming in in a, in a perpendicular way because uh, we have still the diffuse irradiance, uh, which is coming into in various angles. And then it goes on symmetrically towards the afternoon at uh, sunset. Uh, we have a very flat angle and very high reflection losses. So you might wonder, what is this curve uh, then? This is uh, uh, after sunset, we still have irradiance, uh, diffuse irradiance only. And this diffuse irradiance is an average angle, not too bad. It's uh, uh, can say about a 60 degrees angle. And this represents the according reflection or the optical performance, what you see here. So you lose about 10% uh, due to the reflections there. Uh, if you uh, make a more advanced model, uh, you uh, come so first we just observe this part, so the interface between air and glass and the reflection first without any variation of the incidence angle, uh, the second line with, with uh, considering uh, the incidence angle. Now we consider the whole, um, uh, uh, the, all the other interfaces and at the end, the, um, what we see later, uh, the bold line will represent uh, the irradiance what really reaches uh, the solar cell. So see, uh, this is a bold line, which all model included. Um, 
So this is what actually arrives uh, here most realistically modeled uh, in the solar cell. So they have losses of 15% uh, to do that. If we vary, vary that model a bit, for example, if we um, don't consider dispersion, so we just take all the refractive index at a wavelength of 800 nanometer. Usually, uh, if you have refractive index, they are measured at a wavelength of 150 nanometers because this is a uh, usual optical uh, wavelength we consider, but while silicon solar cells have their maximum uh, spectral conversion efficiency at 800 nanometer, we take 800 nanometer here as a reference and uh, just take the values of the um, optical um, incident, uh, opt optical refractive index at 800 nanometers. Then we see uh, that uh, the a performance is uh, the optical performance is slightly better, half a percent about, uh, but it's not realistic. The actual performance is a bit lower if you consider dispersion. The other way, uh, if we don't consider internal reflection, so we uh, just consider the uh, 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 amount of irradiance reaching the solar cells and the reflected part uh, we consider as totally lost. Um, so this is uh, here the the reflected part, uh, and we don't consider that anymore, uh, we come uh, to an underestimation of the cell reaching energy flow uh, here. These are the dotted uh, lines here. It's not a lot, it's a lot uh, less half than half a percent. And uh, um, uh, the truth is just this is a bold line where we consider all modeling. And uh, by this model, then we can think about improvement of the optical performance of a PV module. But first, ta let's take a look at the spectral effect. Um, as you already know, uh, we have different sun spectra at different parts of the day. This is calculated for a point at the equator at the, at the equinox. That means at the 21st of March or the 21st or 22nd of September. And uh, you see this spectra if uh, at the midday uh, the sun is perpendicular at that location and we have a big share on short wavelength and a relative smaller share on long wavelength. If we go towards the evening here at an sun elevation angles of 10 degrees only, we have a spectrum equivalent to AM 5.76. So we see here that the sh share of uh, short wavelength is very small and most of the radiance comes in at long wavelength. And you all know this, this is a sunset and the sun appears to be red because here at 800 nanometers, sun is red. And uh, 800 nanometers, as I mentioned five minutes before, uh, that's actually a quite good uh, efficiency for the solar cell. Here you see the maximum 800 nanometer. This is the uh, sensitivity spectrum of, or the actual uh, spectral efficiency of a multicrystalline silicon cell. You see the maximum is 800 nanometer. So this spectrum is matching very well uh, to the spectral efficiency of the solar cell. Uh, so we consider this also the solar cell model in order to get an accurate representation of the actual performance of the solar solar module. Uh, the spectral efficiency is changing depending on the cell type and also on the temperature. So uh, this I mentioned now was crystalline silicon. So this is uh, uh, that uh, spectral sensitivity. If you have amorphous uh, silicon only. Uh, it's much more sensible in the short wave, wave area. If you have other material like CIGS or CIS here, it uh, can still use a long wavelength uh, also. Here the dotted line is the AM1.5 spectrum to see how good they're matching. Um, but this is uh, just for um, midday, not for, um, uh, for the uh, different situation mentioned before. Um, also, I mentioned uh, that the spectrum, spectral efficiency can change. Uh, this is due to temperature. If you have a high operating temperature, uh, then uh, the activation energy needed to uh, liberate uh, an electron is lower due to the uh, thermal excitation. And then this spectrum is a bit spread into longer wavelength with a lower energy. And uh, so you have a little bit broader uh, uh, spectral sensitivity and uh, you see this uh, by the current. The current is a little bit increased, not very much. The effect uh, of decreased uh, voltage uh, due to higher temperature is uh, much more profound uh, 
uh, but this is, is also considered in that model. Here we see a scheme of the optical terminal and the electrical power flows at a PV model. The first uh, we already discussed about the irradiance. Some of the incoming irradiance is either reflected according to the Fresnel equations or it's transmitted if the wavelength cannot be absorbed, for example, at amorphous uh, silicon, uh, it cannot absorb uh, longer wavelength and uh, this part is being transmitted and cannot be used for photovoltaic energy conversion. So the rest is either uh, transformed into electrical power or is transformed into heat and this heat flow has to be dissipated either by convection on the model surface or either by terminal radiation. The convection is pro almost linear to the uh, difference of uh, model temperature and ambient temperature uh, while uh, the radiation, the terminal radiation goes in with a power of 4 of the model uh, temperature. Actually it's a radiation exchange with the model surface and the ambient temperature. The ambient could consist of the sky or the ground and we discuss this now a little bit more in detail. So this is a, a heat transfer from the solar cell um, 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 to the environment. So first we have an absorption of all irradiance in the solar cell. A part of it is transformed into electrical power flow. The rest is all transformed into heat. This um, heat uh, power flow has to be dissipated either by the front surface through the model cover materials um, and then this is a thermal resistance and then from the surface it uh, can be either transferred via convective heat transfer as we see here. So we have the convective heat transfer coefficient, the temperature between ambient uh, temperature and front temperature and the module area here and uh, the heat transfer coefficient is not a constant coefficient, it's rather complicated. It consists of the Nusselt number and uh, lambda which is uh, the characteristic of uh, air, it's the uh, uh, thermal conductivity of the air and uh, the temperature difference as we've seen before divided by the so-called characteristic length of the module in meters and uh, times the uh, module area as we already know and then this Nusselt number, the empiric value is uh, according to that formula 0 0.56 then the so-called uh, critical Rayleigh number times the sinoid of gamma, this is gamma m, the model elevation of the module uh, to a power of a third, a fourth, or the, the fourth uh, square of that, um, or plus a 0 0.13, uh, the Rayleigh number to a power of a third, uh, minus the critical Rayleigh number uh, to a power of a third. This Rayleigh number consists of the so-called Grassoff number times the Prandtl number, and uh, this is 0 0.71, uh, G, uh, which is the acceleration of gravity uh, times uh, uh, the cubic of the characteristic length uh, times uh, the uh, expansion coefficient of air uh, times the temperature difference and uh, this uh, nu is the so-called kinematic viscosity in swear and the critical Rayleigh number is this formula also consisting uh, in the formula the elevation angle of the module. Uh, these are typical values uh, for the kinematic viscosity and uh, the thermal expansion coefficient of the air. We see this in, uh, a little bit later in detail. Then we have here uh, the radiative heat uh, transfer. So as I already mentioned, it depends uh, to the fourth power of the, um, uh, of the temperature. Then uh, we have uh, this constant sigma. This is Stefan Boltzmann constant times uh, the emissivity of the front surface. Uh, while it's a radiation exchange, we have to also consider the emissivity of the sky. And then uh, we have to have a so-called viewing angle or a view factor. It's uh, sometimes called from front uh, to sky. We also discuss it a little bit later. Uh, then the same applies uh, for the radiation exchange from the front uh, with the ground. Uh, with the same, but here we have the ground temperature and uh, the view factor uh, from the front to the ground. Same um, also happens on the backside here. Uh, so we have here the um, backside uh, temperature radiation exchange and the ground. 
and the radiation exchange from the backside with the sky. This all depends on the elevation angle on the module. We see is in this following formula. The first we discuss the convective heat transfer coefficients. The units are watt per Kelvin per square meter. Then we have the so-called Nusselt number. It's uh, without units. Um, so for the convection on the backside, uh, we can reduce this Nusselt number by the buoyancy. So therefore, it just remains a Nusselt number is 0 0.56, the fourth root of the Rayleigh number times the sinoid of the elevation angle of the module. Then we have the Rayleigh number, uh, which is unity, which is doesn't have any units, same as the critical Rayleigh number. Uh, with the characteristic length of the module in meters is also unity, and the cross of the number is also unity, the Prandtl number is also unity, the elevation angle of the module is gamma m, the terminal conductivity of the air lambda is in watt per Kelvin per square meter. Then we have the kinematic viscosity, the unit of that is meter square divided by seconds. Then we have the thermal expansion coefficient of air. Beta is uh, 1 divided by Kelvin, and uh, the emissivities uh, are all unity. So uh, for F, it's front surface. Uh, emissivity B is a uh, back surface. The emissivity of ground is E uh, epsilon G, um, and also unity. And epsilon S is for the emissivity, emissivity of the sky. Then we have the Stefan Boltzmann constant is uh, sigma 5.67 times a to a power of minus eight watts per square meter per uh, divided by uh, Kelvin to a power of four. And then now we have the relative view angle. We uh, see that a little bit in detail. So the view angle from uh, the front to the sky is half one plus sinoid 90 degrees minus the module elevation angles. We test that, we check that now, for example, if we have the module flat on, the, uh, on this ground, so we have zero elevation angle. So we would have 90 degrees minus zero is 90 degrees. Sinite of 90 degrees is one. One plus one is two divided by two is one. So we have here relative viewing angle for a model lying flat on the ground of one. We have the viewing angle from the front to the ground, uh, a half one minus sinot 90 degrees minus gamma s while gamma uh, gamma s uh, gamma um, gamma m sorry is zero. We have a sinot of 90 degrees, which is one. One minus one is zero, so we have a viewing angle of zero. That's correct because it's lying flat on the roof. Then uh, we apply the same for the backside. Uh, so uh, instead of sinot, we have cosine, and uh, these are the adequate formulas. Uh, for the radiation exchange from the backside with the sky. This is usually rather small, but the major um, participant is here, the uh, radiation exchange between the backside and the ground. And this viewing angle is half one plus sinoid gamma m. If you use that model, so you can get a quite accurate representation of the actual temperature. This is shown here. So uh, we used that model to predict the temperature. Uh, we used a constant wind speed because we didn't know at uh, that day which uh, wind speed uh, will happen. Uh, so we took uh, two meters per sec. Uh, and um, uh, the dots are the actual uh, measured temperatures. Uh, and uh, the bold line is the calculated or simulated temperature. You see here, uh, we are pretty close uh, to the actual numbers. We see some deviations, but this was a uh, due to the actual wind speed. Uh, what happened there, it was not constant at two meters per second, but changed a lot. For example, if we take a look at 2 p.m., we see uh, that the actual wind speed has been significantly higher uh, than the uh, two meters per second uh, used in the calculations. You see this led to a reduction of the actual cell temperature. This was predicted, this was lower, sure, if there's a more wind, it cools and the actual cell temperature has been lower. Uh, something uh, in the opposite direction happened at 4 p.m. So we see that the actual wind speed was lower than two meters per second, and this led to an increased actual cell temperature. These are uh, the ambient temperature we used uh, there, and the measured and the, the used for simulation here. 
So this is a quite good model to really predict uh, already the um, operating temperature. Here you have the temperature and the irradiance. You can calculate actual conversion efficiency. This is done here. Uh, so we have here uh, the conversion efficiency. This was a quite old model with an uh, um, uh, efficiency under standard test conditions of 10% only. And nowadays, uh, models, standard models have almost double uh, that efficiency. Uh, and uh, here you see as another parameter the model inclination angle. Uh, so you see usually we have in Germany about 30 degrees of inclination angle. 90 degrees of in uh, inclination angle would represent a facade. Or zero degrees of elevation angle would be that the models are flatly lying on the ground. And here you have the efficiency during the time of day. So you see here uh, we have a quite good efficiency in the very early morning. Uh, it's rather cold, the module, and there's diffuse irradiance only. Then it starts at sunrise at 6 o'clock. Then, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, we have a lot of reflections here. So performance is hindered uh, by uh, the reflection. So the optical performance is very bad. And then the sun goes up, uh, and we see here uh, that the efficiency has a certain maximum here. But then efficiency is going down. This is not due to the optical performance, but to the thermal performance. While, the, especially if the model is very flat on the surface, uh, the convection is uh, very much reduced and we have a very high cell temperature. And this leads to a significant drop in performance uh, at around midday and in the early afternoon. This is less enhanced if you incline the model a bit. So if you incline the model, for example, to 30 degrees, then there could be some convection also on the backside, and this cools the module, and therefore the uh, uh, performance is better uh, for a more inclined surface. Best is sure if you have a 90 degrees, uh, but then we have some problems with the radiance, and uh, then uh, we have lower performance due uh, to the uh, reduced irradiance levels on uh, the on the module. How we can improve that? Uh, one uh, thing I was mentioning is just we have we use an adequate inclination angle, so both optimized for optimal irradiance, but also for our best thermal performance. Usually, if you go to a, um, a equatorial um, location, I would choose uh, theoretically uh, an inclination angle of zero. But as you see here, that's very bad uh, for the thermal performance. So you uh, even if you lose. Uh, uh, a small percentage uh, by uh, the optical uh, performance uh, here at 10, 30 degrees. Uh, it's much better due to the enhanced uh, backside, um, um, uh, um, backside uh, uh, convection here and the dissipation and reduced temperature. This is a um, way of optical uh, performance enhancement. Uh, so you, if a uh, make a structure uh, on the surface of the module. This is a, a very smart structure. Uh, the structure is exactly uh, placed over the front contacts. And uh, so it uh, deviates the lights, uh, which would theoretically, if it would, be, if it would have a flat surface, uh, which would directly, oh, sorry, uh, hit the uh, front contacts uh, and be lost. Um, it is deviated here to a photovoltaic active area here on this side and also on this side too. And uh, therefore we reduce uh, the uh, loss due uh, to the metallization uh, of the front contacts. You can also apply this to the cell spacing. We have to have a certain spacing between the row of cells, between the cell rings. And uh, we can also uh, deflect uh, the income light uh, from um, uh, the light over the gaps into a photovoltaic active areas. Here at this example, so here on the right side we apply this on a glass, here on the left side not, so the flat surface and we have here, uh, it visually appears much thicker, the front contact, but it's normal and this appears really small. This is just an optical effect due to the V groove. The, the contacts here actually are quite the same size, but here Due to this V grooves here and the deflection of the light, it appears are really to be much thin. The V, v groove angle here is 120 degrees. 
can also optimize uh, the optical matching between uh, the different layers. Uh, so this is already done a little bit by uh, the anti-reflective layer on the solar cell. As you see here, but uh, we can also think about matching uh, uh, here about an additional anti-reflective layer, which is done nowadays. Usually you have an additional anti-reflective layer or matching glass reflective index better to the EVA matching uh, refractive index and so on. Uh, let's look at that. Uh, so we have here uh, the refractive index of the top layer. This is usually glass. Um, as I mentioned there, the refractive index is 1.54. So this is for a real module. And the second layer, which is, as you saw, uh, EVA, ethinyl vinyl acetate, the plastic layer. And here we have usually a refractive index of 1.45. So this is our case. In total, we have an optical performance of 86.5% the vicinity. Uh, but let's take a look. This was calculated with all possible refractive index and we have a maximum here and the maximum is almost 90% of optical performance. So we can improve 3.5% um, here. Uh, if we match it perfectly, so we would have uh, for the, uh, the optimal refractive index for the top layer would be 1.35 and for the second layer, 1.75. Oh, it's quite hard to find a glass uh, with an refractive index of 1.35, uh, but uh, we found out uh, that uh, what has exactly uh, that refractive index of 1.35 uh, down to 1.33. So we just applied uh, um, um, a film of water here in order to reach uh, that point. Um, not really that point because we couldn't reach, uh, we couldn't change the EVA inside the model, so we stayed here. But you see, there is some improvement, so about two percent of improvement uh, due to the optical refinement. Uh, this was applied uh, for perpendicular incidence, uh, but you can think also what happens if you have uh, incidence angle of 80 degrees, for example, in the uh, morning or in the evening. The sun is coming in, in a flatter angle, and then uh, this uh, looks a bit different. So here's still the real refractive index, 1.54 uh, for the class and 1.45 uh, for the EVA. This is our real case. Then we have uh, losses of about 44% uh, due to uh, the uh, hindered optical transmission of the encapsulation layer. Uh, the maximum is here in the vicinity of uh, 70%, uh, so 30%, but then we should have a really uh, very low refractive index in the vicinity of 1.07. And uh, for the EVA, should be 1.5. Okay, that's feasible, but uh, this is uh, not really feasible with a uh, solid material. So um, i show you some prototypes, what according to our, um, our uh, theory, what we, we explained there, we, we wanted to improve the performance. So first, let's take a look at the general performance. Uh, so here you see uh, the effect of um, temperature. So you know this already. Uh, so we have here the dash line is the performance under standard test conditions. So constant uh, cell temperature of 25 degrees. And uh, here, uh, if we increase the temperature, voltage is reduced at crystalline silicon solar cells, vicinity of minus 0.4% per degree of tem temperature. Um, and uh, the other way around, if we decrease temperature, uh, the voltage and so is the power is increased. And then we did uh, here uh, some kind of uh, uh, tank here on the back side to absorb uh, the heat uh, uh, of, of the solar cells in order to re reduce operating temperature, or at least to uh, keep it uh, close to the ambient temperature. Also here, this is a double use um, in order to avoid additional costs for the tank and the mounting we integrated this. So this serves also as a mounting, so we can use the model uh, put it on the roof and uh, fill uh, that just with water so we don't have to spend money for additional mounting. It's a kind of integrated system. So this is also a uh, um, measure to reduce um, BOS costs, balance of system costs. 
we call the TIPFIS Thermal Ends PV Module with Integrated Standing. Let's take a look at the results. So this is standard test condition, so 25 degrees with wind speed here. And uh, here, uh, this line with the small circles is uh, the actual ambient temperature being measured. And uh, here we compared it to conventional modules. Uh, the M55 is a, a single crystalline um, PV module uh, from Siemens during that uh, time. It's quite a long time ago. And uh, this is a multi-crystalline um, module by AEG Telefunken here. You see there uh, just the temperature is quite elevated here at uh, around midday. And um, in the orange line, this is our TEPFIS module uh, with the attached tank. And you see temperatures have been significantly reduced uh, and they stay uh, in the vicinity of the ambient temperature. So only in the late afternoon they are more elevated than the temperature and during nighttime they will come back to uh, the original um, ambient temperature. And this means if we have reduced temperature we have increased voltage and this means increased performance of our PV module. So this is uh, the according um, uh, temperature coefficient. So we see here that uh, power goes up uh, with uh, decreased temperature uh, because uh, the coefficient uh, is minus 0 0.44. So if you increase temperature, you lose about half a percent per Kelvin. If you decrease the temperature, power goes up by half a percent per Kelvin. And this is the result. So uh, um, this is uh, with, without uh, the tank, uh, as you saw before, from the M55 module. This is M55 module, and uh, with the TEPFIS here, uh, we have an increased uh, power output, as you saw here. Uh, in total, the energy yield, the, the uh, increase, is about 10%. As mentioned before, uh, for the optical confinement, we can use a water film. Uh, this we applied here. So we have a very small aquarium pump here, and this pumps water along the module. And uh, here on the front part, and uh, this also, uh, these are modules, conventional modules, um, without uh, any water flow. And see it already at the brightness of the module. So the uh, front modules, they uh, reflect, they are, uh, seem to be brighter. This means more reflection because the brighter, the more reflection. And the uh, back module here uh, seems to be actually a bit darker. This means reflections are reduced. And we have two effects now. We have uh, less reflections and also a bit of cooling. Uh, there's no tank here, but only cooling takes place via the flowing water film here. It also looks quite nice if you take, uh, if you see it in live. Um, don't have a video, unfortunately. This was in 99, so we didn't. Uh, video cameras haven't been so popular, and cell phones didn't have a, a, <laughs> have a, a camera then. And uh, you see here the performance, the conversion efficiency of the different modules. So here on the back, the the the, uh, the M55 with the border on here, um, it's performing significantly better uh, with as the model without the border film, due to optical reasons and due to thermal reasons. You see here the gain is quite uh, considerably. So here we have a conversion efficiency in the vicinity um, of above 12%, uh, while here we have about 10.5%. So I mentioned before, uh, we can also take a look at the BOS costs, uh, because this is a significant share of the total cost of the PV, PV systems. And I mentioned it before, we made this one prototype uh, with, of acrylic and uh, uh, made the uh, mounting there, but acrylic is really expensive, so much of a cheaper material. Um, also, if you take a look at uh, the total cost, uh, this is a support structure, so we want to save some money. Installation, we can save some money there. Um, by increasing the yield of the PV modules, we can reduce uh, the size of PV panel necessary, so we can reduce that part a bit. We cannot reduce that part, and uh, that part, but uh, we can integrate those components into the cooling system. And by this, we can not increase performance a lot, but we can increase lifetime. Because um, I know we didn't talk about it, but we will, uh, when you go to the battery chapter, uh, you will see uh, that 
uh, the lifetime of a battery highly depends on the operating temperature and if you decrease uh, the operating temperature of a battery by 10 degrees only uh, you may double its lifetime so this was a new prototype made out of fiberglass uh, in future we wanted to make it out of polyurethane uh, or polyethylene and uh, so it also looks uh, much nicer here was in cooperation with the, the department of, of uh, design here uh, it's called now integrated solar home systems uh, so basically as you saw before with the acrylic with the water tank but we additionally in, uh, integrate the battery and uh, the charge control and the inverter uh, in order to reduce operating temperature and in is um, lengthen lifetime of those and we did some measurements uh, the measurements haven't been as good as the acrylic version but uh, you still see this is a conventional solar home systems and it, this is not during the day this is uh, as a function of global irradiance as you see here if we have uh, standard test conditions we tested it in brazil so sometimes happens that we have uh, such high irradiance levels but you see here then temperature is about elevated by 30 kelvins above ambient temperature so for example if you have uh, 30 degrees of ambient temperature plus 30 degrees um, due to the irradiance we have a total temperature of 60 degrees and uh, by our uh, integrated solar home system we are able to reduce uh, that temperature increase uh, for example here to 12 degrees kelvin that means we have 30 degrees plus 12 degrees then we would have an operating temperature of 42 degrees if we consider the lower module that means that we have two modules here top modules and lower modules here um, this increase um, in uh, this reduction in operating cell temperature was even bigger because uh, the uh, uh, water uh, due to stratification the lower part was a bit cooler than that so this was uh, the measurements we carried out this is here's the city of rio de janeiro this was the roof where we installed it this is a pyranometer to measure the irradiance and here we have integrated the inverter and the battery controller and the battery and here just is a conventional brazilian plug here and uh, we have electricity going there so uh, the results of that project had been uh, that we have an enhanced performance ratio we have a low operating temperature which uh, leads in total to a nine percent of more electrical yield more electrical energy being generated we have increased reliability because during installation uh, there couldn't be anything you can uh, deliver that system already prefabricated so all the electrical connections are already given from the module to the charge controller from the charge controller to the battery from the battery to the charge controller then to the inverter and then to the plug this is all uh, this possible faults are all eliminated because they are tested in the factory and we just have the electrical plug as the only interface here we don't need any fixation sometimes it's really uh, um, um, problematic if you uh, drill some holes into the roof and there's a rain and they could be is in damage in the buildings and so on so you try to avoid that and uh, try to make uh, the installation only via dust make a very heavy models either concrete but here we have 150 liters of water so this is uh, as good as a concrete uh, foundation here and it's all very quick to install so the empty part reads about 15 kilograms you put it on the roof fill it up with water and that's it another way to increase or reduce balance of system costs uh, um, has been uh, some years ago to integrate it, uh, the modules into facade elements so this is for central european conditions um, this is was for an, an austrian um, facade maker so uh, we have solar module um, and this was uh, equipped uh, with uh, a tube uh, for um, profit of the warm water and also for cooling the module and uh, heating up uh, the, the water for the households and uh, the necessary insulation you have to have in the facade element anyway in uh, central Europe uh, to um, uh, reduce uh, heating costs um, this was such a, a facade element in order to a triple use so just uh, generating electricity generating one warm water and do the necessary insulation of the building so we have now our exercise about the evaluation of improvements of pv models we investigate three different kinds of improvements thermal improvements 
optical improvement and lifetime extensions. We just start with the optical improvements. So uh, as an optical measure, we add an anti-reflective layer on the surface of the module. It uh, by a reduced refractive index, as we saw when we did the optimization, uh, we can improve the transmission or reduce reflections. And uh, the yield gained by that is 3% over the day. It's already energy weighted. And uh, the tasks to be filled out is for which a part of the day that measure works most effective. Considering a standard installation, that means orientated towards south at a module elevation angle of 30 degrees. And why is it so? Second part is, does it make economically sense if such a layer would cost 10 euros per square meter? Considering a module efficiency of 17% and a module costs of 30 cents per watt peak. If you know watt peak is considered the standard test conditions. What are the maximum extra costs for that measures, considering the upper parameters given? Are there impacts on the balance of systems costs? So do we have to spend some extra money on uh, mounting systems or so? Third part is, what uh, will be the effect on the electrical power output parameter? Is there an impact on voltage, current or power or um, uh, more of them? Then we come to the thermal measures. So uh, we found a new backsheet material with an increased thermal emissivity that reduces the operating cell temperature by, by two degrees over the whole day, already energy weighted. Otherwise it would be getting too complicated for you to calculate with your two degrees over the whole day, which is actually not to choose, but in order to simplify the exercise. And uh, what further is given, the module has a temperature coefficient of minus 0.5% per Kelvin for the power output, TZ for power output. Um, for which part of that day uh, that measures works most effective considering also a standard installation which is orientated towards south at a module elevation angle of 30 degrees. Why? Second, does it make economically uh, sense uh, if such a layer costs uh, 10 euros per square meter double efficiency uh, module efficiency of 17% at module costs of 0.3 euro what peak or what are the maximum extra costs for that measures in considering the upper parameters given and uh, third part in general also what will be the effect on the electrical um, output parameters for voltage for current and for power third and last part um, it's about uh, lifetime extension of vr terminal measures so we apply the phase change material pcm that reduces the thermal stress. That means the variation of the modules due to clouds or during day and night exchange. And this reduces the, uh, the temperature difference and the speed of temperature changes in the module and that lengthens lifetime. And uh, we can observe an extension of lifetime in that case from 25, 30 years. On the other hand, the thermal continuity of that PCM is not perfect. So the energy weighted temperature will increase by three degrees because the thermal dissipation cannot take place as efficient as if you would have only a thin film um, backsheet without PCM. 3.1. What effects do you expect during the course of the day considering a standard installation also south elevation angle of 30 degrees? 3.2. Does it make ec uh, sense economically if such a layer also costs euro per square meter model efficiency 17% and model costs of 30 cents per watt? What are the maximum extra costs for that measures considering the other uh, parameters given? And um, very last question, what will be the effect on the electrical power output in terms of voltage current and power? That's it, that's your homework. Please prepare it until next uh, Tuesday or Monday and um, I will make a video on the solutions. Thank you very much.